today. So we're getting started a little bit later today. Um, so uh, at the end of lecture last time, I'd mentioned uh, a list of Alexandrian mathematicians, or I should say um, mathematicians who at least studied in Alexandria. So three of them spent most of their life in Alexandria. Uh, Archimedes was uh, known or did most of his work uh, in Syracuse. So um, I'm going to write out that list again um, because this uh, this basically uh, you know you don't know it yet but this is this is almost the last hurrah of Greek mathematics um, and certainly is about to be the absolute pinnacle um, when we get to Archimedes so uh, the uh, the topic at hand is uh, Alexandrian mathematics um, from uh, roughly 300 BC uh, to 200 BC. Okay, so there would be um, another stint that I'll talk about uh, a bit later, and then that will that will be that in terms of uh, uh, math in the ancients, and then there will be uh, there will be kind of a void of activity mostly uh, which won't pick up again fully um, uh, until until almost the European Renaissance so um, so this is uh, uh, we're, we're fast approaching um, kind of uh, the a nice dividing line between uh, the ancient and the much closer to modern um, and so uh, the four that I had mentioned uh, I believe I'd already mentioned these. Um, so uh, Aristarchus, um, so Aristarchus of uh, Samos. So this is the same uh, place that Pythagoras hailed from. So same island. Uh, Aristarchus of Samos. He was uh, active from 310 BC uh, to 250 BC. Um, <clears throat> So he's the first one we'll talk about. Um, the second one, uh, though, certainly not uh, in importance, is uh, Archimedes of Syracuse. Um, so Archimedes uh, was active from 287 BC to 212 BC. We know exactly when Archimedes died because he died in the siege of Syracuse during the Second Punic War. Um, so, uh, I'm going to actually talk about the other three instead. I'm going to leave Archimedes, uh, alone. Um, so there's Apollonius of Perga. Um, so Apollonius of Perga, uh, was active from 260, uh, BC to 190 BC. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, your textbook actually doesn't, uh, doesn't do justice to Apollonius. Um, it seems to not think too highly of him, uh, and only gives him like two paragraphs of uh, of exposition. But um, he, in a way, um, like, and I'll talk about this more when I talk about Archimedes. But uh, Archimedes and Apollonius, and since Apollonius died uh, later, it was really Apollonius was the cutting off point. Um, they mark kind of a, uh, a a gap. There is a gap. Uh, even before the later Dark Ages, there's a gap after Apollonius until the next uh, mathematicians of note, uh, kind of. Um, and then Eratosthenes. Uh, so Eratosthenes of Cyrene. Okay. Um, so all of these are part of the Alexandrian school. As I said uh, previously, it's uh, assumed that uh, Archimedes studied um, at Alexandria, and uh, there are some uh, letters that Archimedes wrote to, uh, to mathematicians at uh, Alexandria that have been um, preserved. These are some of the things that survived. Um, and that also leads me to another uh, thing that I'll talk about, which is um, how we came to know uh, as much about Archimedes as we, as we do, um, because there's a very interesting story. Uh, if you 
haven't heard of the Archimedes palimpsest, um, I will uh, I will talk a little bit about that. I'll tar I'll type that into chat just because it's a weird word in case you haven't heard of a palimpsest before. Um, but um, anyway, I'll mention that uh, when I get to talking about Archimedes. So um, just going down the line here, like I said, I'm going to actually discuss uh, 1, 3, and 4 first. I'm going to leave Archimedes. Uh, that was a bad attempt at a star. I'm going to leave Archimedes uh, to, uh, to last here because I have the most to say about him. Um, and so uh, what uh, are the others known for? So um, Aristarchus is mostly known for uh, application to astronomy. Um, so uh, his main contribution um, is the following, and this would ultimately be um, a thing that uh, uh, that Eratosthenes would use to do the thing that Eratosthenes is famous for, um, which I mentioned last time it had to do with computing the circumference of the Earth, and so. Um, what uh, what is the thing that Aristarchus was famous for? So Aristarchus held that uh, if you uh, if you look at a triangle, uh, let me draw a decent triangle here. So if you if you look at a triangle um, that is determined by if we think about this. Uh, being determined by um, sun, moon, and earth. And if I have some triangle here like this, and we'll say that uh, uh, here's the earth, and here's the sun, and here is the moon. Okay, well, uh, if I draw um, the moon at this vertex like this, so here's the vertex associated to the moon. Okay, then if I think of splitting the moon into pieces, what I notice, or what Aristarchus noticed, is that when this angle, right, when this SME angle is exactly 90 degrees, then what portion of the moon is visible from Earth? Well, If I'm at Earth looking this way, this would be first quarter, right? So this would be first quarter. So uh, Aristarchus said that, you know, when moon is is in first quarter, uh, what this meant is that this uh, SME, right, so angle SME is a right angle. Okay, um, and so uh, thus, of course, um, if SME is a right angle and when the moon is in the first quarter, uh, what this means is that uh, you can see the sun and the moon together in the sky at the same time. Okay, so um, since both are visible... Uh, in the sky at the same time when the moon's in first quarter. So, uh, Aristarchus was able to measure the angle in question. And found it. To be 29 thirtieths of a right angle. Okay.
And so, looking at the picture here, uh, of course, oh, well, I should correct this a little bit. So, uh, the angle in question uh, that was being measured was actually SEM, this angle. Okay. The angle formed by sun to, so sun, earth, and moon, right? So, this angle that occurs at earth. Okay. And this angle he computed to be 29 30th of a right angle. Now, um, if, you know, we're actually. Uh, measuring right the actual uh, so the actual quantity the actual measurement is uh, 0.9981 of a right angle <laughs> um, okay because of course you know in the actual picture because the Sun is so far away uh, the idea is that this you know, triangle is really, 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 really stretched out, right? This is a really, really long triangle. Okay. And so what is it that he was actually trying to do here? So Aristarchus ultimately was trying to say something about the distances to the moon and to the sun. Okay, so using trigonometry to say something about the distances to the moon and the sun. And this is based on um, observations, right? Just literally observing uh, the sky. And so um, you know, he was, he was trying to make a more general, um, argument here. If he had actually used, um, you know, if he had actually used true trig, that is with trig functions, you know, sine and cosine, he would have actually been able to do this a lot more accurately. But even as it was, he was able to do this, uh, pretty well. Um, and he found when he did this, so let me, so... And you can see how he did this. By looking at the shadow cast by the Earth upon the Moon during the lunar eclipse, one may also compare the size of the Moon with that of the Earth. Um, and since the Sun is far away, the size of the Earth is approximately the same as that of its shadow. Right? So Aristarchus found that the diameter of the Earth divided by the diameter of the Moon uh, is roughly 7. Uh, and the actual figure is about 4. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, and according to Plut Plutarch, supposedly Aristarchus also proposed this hypothesis that uh, the Earth moves in an oblique circle about the Sun at the same time as it turns around its axis. Uh, and so, as the book notes, this uh, seems to be an early Copernican uh, thought um, that we can attribute to Aristarchus, or at least that Plutarch attributes to Aristarchus, that, that um, he said that the Earth moves around the Sun as it's turning on its own axis. So, um, so these early attempts at... Uh, astronomical computations um, that were done, you know, by several cultures. Aristarchus did this that uh, seems to have led, like, specifically into um, uh, into Eratosthenes' uh, computation. So uh, Eratosthenes uh, would later uh, come along and do a similar computation um, that was pretty ingenious that allowed him to compute the circumference of the Earth uh, to pretty good accuracy. Um, and so, uh, that brings me to Apollonius, since, as I said, I'm going to skip Archimedes for now, because uh, I'm going to talk about him a bunch here in a, here in a little bit. So, Apollonius of Perga wrote uh, a treatise called, he, he wrote a few. One is called uh, On Conics. This is his uh, most famous one. Um, he was the master of conic sections, and he brought conic sections into the level of understanding that they were in by the time we get to the 1600s and we get calculus. Okay, so um, so brought uh, conic sections into 
the state of understanding that wouldn't be improved until the 1600s. So it would not be improved upon until the 1600s. Okay, so we've mentioned conic sections before. Um, so these are curves like the parabola, the hyperbola, um, the ellipse, right? The circle's a special case. Um, these are examples of uh, conic sections. The main idea in a conic section, now this is not what Apollonius, uh, this is not how Apollonius defined them. Apollonius defined them in that exact simple way of thinking of, you know, this double cone and a plane intersecting it. So cross sections of a double cone, those give you the conic sections, okay? Uh, but the idea of a conic section is there's a fixed point called the focus, right? Uh, and the conic section, the curve itself, is defined to be the set of all points in a plane uh, such that, um, so it's the set of all points P in some plane such that a point's distance from the focus okay, uh, bears a constant ratio to its distance from a fixed line, which is called the directrix, okay, uh, and that ratio is called the eccentricity, so you may have heard of the term eccentricity uh, when it regards um, an ellipse, right, so uh, an elliptical orbit, for instance, of a celestial body uh, that follows a very eccentric path, this would be a very, so a very eccentric ellipse would be one that's stretched a lot right it's one for which that ratio uh is is large okay so um what do i want to say about apollonius i wanted to at least give a quick uh looking through of on conics this famous work of apollonius so um this is an example. So this is Apollonius's on conics. And I wanted to quickly walk through this to show, oh look, what does Apollonius do? He starts with first definitions. Then proposition one, proposition two, right, and so on. Okay, and of course you see immediately he's showing exactly what the sections of these cones look like, what these curves look like. So it develops exactly like Euclid's elements. Um, we have some really nice pictures showing some of these things, right? There's a parabola. Okay, um, there's an ellipse uh, that's realized as a conic section here. See all these really nice pictures uh, coming uh coming out of this text, right? Really complicated stuff going on. In fact, uh, basically, um, as I said, to make it more complicated than this, you need calculus. So to do anything more uh, in-depth than Apollonius did, you need calculus. Here's a great example of hyperbola, right? So there's plane cutting through double cone. You can see, well, maybe you can see the hyperbola, right? The curve here and paired with the curve here. So those things taken together or the, the entire hyperbola, right? So anyway, um, this is, uh, yeah, here's an example of hyperbola in the plane. Uh, this is a computation on ratios of uh, these points to their this directrix, uh, the distance from these points to the directrix, okay? Again, here's uh, other examples. Okay, and so um, uh, that was the work of Apollonius. Um, he is typically uh, thought of as kind of the uh, the closest to Archimedes among the um, ancient mathematicians who kind of were active at around the same time. Um, he, he wasn't quite on the same level as Archimedes, but uh, he was close. Um, and so Apollonius, uh, you know, his work on conics was, uh, was very... Uh, uh, was very important and was very advanced for the time. Um, in fact, uh, Leibniz, right, later one of the co-discoverers of calculus, said that 
Um, the person who reads uh, Apollonius and Archimedes will immediately have much less respect for the leading scientists and leading mathematicians of the day uh, because it's amazing to realize how um, how advanced they were so long ago. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite an achievement. So I wanted to mention one more before getting exclusively to, uh, to Archimedes, um, and that's Eratosthenes. Okay, so Eratosthenes. Um, we have already come across Eratosthenes in the context of his sieve of Eratosthenes, which was a very simple way of writing out a bunch of prime numbers, right? If I start out with a list of numbers and I, then I start at the smallest number and I start, so if I start at two and then I circle two and then I cross out everything after two that's a multiple, all right? When I return to the beginning of my list, the first number that I haven't crossed out also has to be prime. So then I circle that number, so in that case three, I would cross out all its multiples and I would continue doing this and of course if I theoretically if I do this forever I will have circled every single prime number, right? So that was due to Eratosthenes. Um, so that's one uh, that's one way in which we've already seen um, what uh, Eratosthenes did. Um, the thing that Eratosthenes is most known for, however, is coming up with a very accurate approximation of um, the circumference of the Earth. So approximated the circumference of the Earth to uh, quite good accuracy. Okay, he wasn't he wasn't too far off. So what was uh, what was his method? Okay, this is kind of the ingenious thing. Okay, so Eratosthenes right had lived in Alexandria, and uh, he noticed that uh, the distance from Alexandria to uh, a town um, modern day Aswan uh, is in ancient times it's called Syene. Um, so. The distance to Alexandria to Syene um, was whatever it was. It was the thing that could be computed. And when I say it could be computed, it meant that Eratosthenes could pay someone to, to figure it out. And so um, legend has it that he paid a person to actually travel from uh, uh, from Alexandria to uh, to Aswan or to Syene, um, actually um, counting along the way how many... <laughs> how many steps it took um but uh the point is that uh, the distance from uh from alexandria to to syene could be computed um now i've been to a swan um i so i took a train from cairo um and so it was a night train it was 13 hours by train from um from cairo to uh, a swan so uh a swan is pretty far away um, in the scheme of the entire circumference of the Earth, however, it's not uh, too big of a too big of a trip, um, and ultimately the the distance didn't really matter that much because you're going to see what Eratosthenes uh, planned to do with with this distance. What was so special about this town, Syene? Um, so Syene was uh, it, it happens to lie almost exactly on the Tropic of Cancer. Okay. So, um, Syene lies almost entirely, or almost exactly on the Tropic of Cancer, which means that on a midsummer's day at noon, the sun is almost directly overhead. Okay. All right. Um, and so, um, the idea here, uh, is that, you know, you could, you could witness this, right, from the bottom of a well, right? Like the, the sun would shine, you know, directly to the bottom of of a well, it would be directly overhead, okay? Um, and so, uh, then what you do is you measure how far off the sun is from being overhead at noon on that same day in Alexandria, okay? And so, in Syene, which is a swan, uh, at noon, uh, 
on Midsummer's Day. Sun is directly overhead. Okay, so this is insane. In Alexandria, at noon on Midsummer's Day, the sun is not directly overhead. Okay, it was, according to uh, Eratosthenes' own estimation, it is 360 degrees divided by 50 from directly overhead. Okay. All right. Now, here's where the genius comes in, right? His argument was that this same angle was subtended at the center of the earth by the arc joining Alexandria to Syene which was south of Alexandria, some distance, okay, to be computed. Okay. And so what is the idea here? Well, by Euclid, right? Just a theorem straight from the elements. This is book six, proposition 33 of the elements. The length of an arc of a circle is proportional to the angle it subtends at the center, right? And so all that is left to be done is measuring the distance from Alexandria to Syene. Okay. And so, uh, the maybe I'll write that here. So the idea here is Euclid, right, book six, theorem 33, prop 33, says that... Uh, the length of an arc of a circle right, whatever that length is is proportional to the angle it subtends at the center at the center of the circle Okay, this angle being the same angle measured at Alexandria. So all that needed to be done was measuring this distance that I mentioned at the very beginning. So that's all that was required, was measuring the distance from Alexandria to Syene. Now... What was this distance? It turned out that this is 5,000 stadia, stadia being the unit of measurement. Uh, stadia was, uh, it was one length of the Olympic track. Okay. All right. So, um, to show a picture of what it is that's going on here, The circle represents the Earth, or the surface of the Earth. A is Alexandria. S is Syene. 5,000 stadia is this arc. Okay. Notice that this angle and this angle are congruent, right, by the fact that corresponding angles are congruent, for instance. Okay, and this angle is 1 of 360 degrees. And so what do I need to do to get the entire circumference? I need to take 5,000 stadia and multiply by 50. Okay. And so he got that uh, the so circumference of the earth in this way is approximately uh, 5 times 5,000 stadia uh, or sorry not 550 that was the amount that was being measured or uh, multiplied by so it's 50 times 5,000 stadia all right which is 250,000 stadia
Okay. How close is that? So this is approximately 45,000 kilometers. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I was going to write 45K kilometers. I wrote 45 kilometers. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's write that out. 45,000 kilometers. Okay. All right. How close is this? So it is actually uh, about 4,000 kilometers. Or, sorry, 40,000 kilometers. Jeez. Okay. Now, um, if you look at the wiki article on, uh, uh, on the method used by Eratosthenes, you'll see that um, they actually... Uh, show that using the exact same methods just with more accurate uh, numbers. So, you know, where did the inaccuracies creep in? Actually, the, the method used was perfectly fine. The method used is, can actually yield numbers like ridiculously close to this. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, what crept in was some of the inaccuracies from actually, you know, some of these measurements that were computed. So the method itself um, can yield extremely accurate results, right? But even you see, you know, even with very crude measurements, you know, how close this ended up being. Um, and so, you know, this is a pretty impressive use of, uh, of the Greek ideas um, about, you know, computing... Right, you're you're computing with these theoretical abstract things, these diagrams you're drawing, uh, but you're able to use those to actually compute, you know, something very concrete. Um, and as I said, this can actually be uh, made uh, a lot uh, a lot more accurate using the exact same method, so long as your measurements are are good. Okay, and so um, one more thing I wanted to mention about Eratosthenes. Um, is that also apparently Eratosthenes was the first person to compute the axial tilt of the Earth. Um, and so I can't, can't remember the proposed method that he, he, that he did this um, with. I'm not sure if that survived um, as an independent work that he did or uh, if this was just ascribed to him uh, by later historians. But, uh, but he's believed to be the first person to also... Um, yeah, compute the axial tilt of the Earth. So it's pretty amazing. Um, which brings me to Archimedes. Okay. Um, so Archimedes, uh, he is the greatest of all time. Uh, he is he is the greatest mathematician in all of history. Certainly the greatest mathematician in, in antiquity. There's no debate uh, at all there. But I would argue there's basically no debate that he's the greatest mathematician ever. Um, and my reasoning is this, right? Um, it's unfair, obviously, to um, try to estimate uh, a mathematician's... Uh, it's clearly unfair to try to estimate a mathematician's uh, rank by just judging something like the amount of knowledge they displayed they have, right? Because it's not fair. Um, you know, the stuff that Archimedes was doing um, is stuff that's taught, you know, in Calc 1 and 2 now. And so um, it's unfair to say, oh, well, you know, anyone who understands math past that, right, has clearly surpassed Archimedes, though. That's clearly ridiculous. Um, it's also, though, uh, not that... In terms of mathematical ability, right, it's not that fair to judge mathematicians by their impact because, of course, we're talking historically here, gaps of thousands of years. Um, and so a mathematician writing, say, in Newton's time or especially in Euler's or Gauss's time, um, it was so much easier for your work to be disseminated. There was printing press by this time, right? Um, so, you know, by the time you have the printing press and the ability to easily replicate copies of your work, um, it's so much easier for your ideas to be spread around. So thinking just in terms of how prolific a mathematician was and how much of their work survived and how much, how widely read 
they were, the influence they had, um, is, you know, that that's a little unfair as well, because it turns out that, uh, in fact, a ton of Archimedes' writings were just totally lost. Um, so a ton of his writings were totally lost. Um, what we knew prior to, like, the 1900s or late 1800s uh, came from translations of translations of his work uh, preserved by uh, Arab and Islamic mathematicians. Um, and uh, the rest would come later uh, from this Archimedes palimpsest uh, that I mentioned. So what is a palimpsest? A palimpsest was, um, before the printing press, um, a medium to write, to physically write, uh, you know, your, uh, if you're writing a textbook, a tome of any kind, um, actually coming up with something to write on was an issue. Uh, if you wanted to come up with a book that was bound and that was maybe more durable, um, you couldn't just, there was no printing press and you couldn't just go down to Staples and get a ream of printing paper. So you wanted to, you know, you, you wanted to find something to write on and palimpsesting was a way of doing this. So what's palimpsesting? It was taking uh, a tome that had already been bound and already had stuff written on the pages and scrubbing the pages. So the pages were often made out of like lamb skin, goat skin, things like that. And it was literally scrubbing the pages. Okay, scrubbing the writing off. Okay, so uh, this was the act of palimpsesting uh, the text that you that you were going you intended to write in. And so you know you would take a tome and maybe the tome was you know like it contained hymns or it contained I don't know something you didn't care that much about and you needed to to write in its pages. You'd scrub off the pages and you'd write your own stuff, right? And maybe of course someone else would do that later, you know, to whatever you'd written on and so on. And so this had been done. To a, to a book containing a bunch of works of Archimedes uh, that had been written down, copied, you know, by hand, of course, right? This, you know, some scribe copied this diligently by hand. A bunch of works of Archimedes had been um, in this tome. The tome had been palimpsested to put um, some kind of uh, religious text over it. Uh, I believe this was in some monastery in... in um, I believe it was originally in some monastery in Turkey um, where this was found. And if you look up the Archimedes Palimpsest, you can see the whole uh, the whole history of it. And it wasn't until, I believe, the late 1800s, maybe the early 1900s, that um, uh, this German linguist guy actually noticed that in this book there was the faintest of writings that looked like geometric diagrams, and it turned out to be works of Archimedes that were previously unknown. Uh, and so um, these were recovered very meticulously by pretty advanced uh, methods. So the earliest methods was literally a guy took a bunch of pictures of the palimpsest like pages and tried to read the stuff that had been scrubbed off and did actually got a lot of it out of that. But much more was discovered when they brought you know really really advanced machinery to bear on it, um, and they recovered a huge amount of stuff original to Archimedes, you know, that hadn't been seen before, um, that had been completely lost. So I encourage you all to, to have a look at that because it's really interesting. But anyway, um, so Archimedes lived from 287 BC to 212 BC. He died in the siege of Syracuse. Okay. Um, a lot of famous stories about Archimedes. One, um, this is one that a lot of people have probably heard. Um, Archimedes uh, had been given a task okay, by King Hero of Syracuse. Uh, so King Hero had, um, had been given as a gift a crown. Okay? The crown was supposedly made of gold, or at least made of, up of some amount of gold. And uh, King Hero wanted Archimedes to come up with a way that he could test what percentage of the crown was actually gold okay to you know make sure that it hadn't been counterfeited or he hadn't been given a gift that was actually insulting because it had just been gold plated or maybe had you know golden paint uh covering it or something and so archimedes thought about this but the point is you know the method that he came up with wasn't allowed to actually damage the crown because in the in the event that the crown actually ended up being gold you know he didn't want it damaged and so Archimedes thought about this, and you know the legend goes that he wasn't able 
to come up with a with um, an answer immediately. Um, and another tale about Archimedes was that he would get so involved in solving a particular problem that he was working on that he wouldn't bathe for weeks or months. He just would not take a bath. Okay, he wouldn't bathe at all. And of course, he smelled terrible, obviously. Um, and so people would like come and abduct him as a group and basically drag him to a bath and force him to bathe, okay, uh, for their own, you know, for his own good and for their own good um, of not having to smell him. And so um, they force him into bath, and uh, supposedly when he's being forced into the bath, he notices, right, when he steps into the bath, that his body displaces some amount of water. And he screams, when he when he realizes this eureka right so he screams eureka which means i've found it i've figured it out okay and he went running through the streets naked screaming eureka uh, which is where the that exclamation comes from uh for that he had figured it out so how had he figured it out from that the idea was to displace some amount of water right using that crown so you take crown you put it into uh into your basin right? Um, some amount of water. You displace that amount of water by some amount. That allows you to know, uh, that allows you to know the volume, right, of, of the object, right? Then all you need to know, right, all you need to be able to do is figure out, if you know the density of gold, right, looking at the volume of that object, you can work out what the amount of gold that should be in the object, right? Um, in fact, right, if you, uh, you know, Literally, this is the Archimedean principle. So if G is the density of gold, okay, so if G is the density of gold and S is, say, density of silver, because I believe it was supposed to be made of both gold and silver. Okay. Then uh, if X is the uh, ounces of gold, right, uh, that uh, are in the object, okay, right. if M is the mass of the object, that could be obtained by just putting it on the scale, okay, so the object is made of both gold and silver, and I want to figure out the amount of gold that's in the object, well then uh, the volume, V, is volume of object. The equation I have is that the volume of the object is X over G plus M minus X, which is the amount of mass of the object with the gold taken away over S, right? So this is the amount of mass that presumably comes from the silver over S. And so I need to know density of gold, the density of silver. I need to know uh, the mass of the object. And if I can find the volume, which I can do using this displacement method, right? Then I know every quantity here except X, so I can solve for X here, right? So I can solve for X once I know V. I can solve for x using this principle of Archimedes and figure out how much gold is actually in the crown. And I don't think in most uh, examples we're actually told uh, what, was, what was the verdict, whether or not the crown was counterfeit or not. So what are the things that Archimedes did? Um, maybe I think I'm going to flip through one of the works of Archimedes uh, right now to give you a taste of what uh, what he did. Let me try to find this calculation. I had it bookmarked earlier. So let's see here. So there's a lot of 
in this book I have, there's a lot of works of Archimedes that make up. Uh, let's see here. Measurement of a Circle, I believe, is the book. Not on the sphere and cylinder. Um, here we go. So this is Archimedes' Measurement of a Circle. Okay. Alright, so here it is. Note the beginning. What is going on here? Okay. So, first proposition. The area of any circle is equal to a right angle triangle in which one of the sides about the right angle is equal to the radius and the other to the circumference of the circle. There's a lot of diagrams going on here. What is it that's happening? These are, of course, the continuation of our good buddy Antiphon, and then later Eudoxus, this idea of inscribing polygons inside and outside of a circle. Okay, and so that is exactly what is happening here. Okay, so this inscribing of ingons is happening in exactly this way. And what is the ultimate goal that Archimedes has? right here. He is estimating this ratio okay, of the circumference to the diameter and what is that ratio? He says it is less than 3 and 1 7th but greater than 3 and 10 71st. What's, what's he doing? He is computing the ratio of the circumference to the diameter What's the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of a circle? It's pi, right? That's the, that's the constant, right, that defines this ratio. So he's estimating pi here, right? He is estimating pi, and he found that pi is less than 3 and 1 7th, but greater than 3 and 10 71ths, okay? And so... So his estimation, right, among other things. So what did Archimedes do? So he said that pi is greater than 3 and 1 sevenths, but less than, uh, or sorry, the other way around. So th uh, pi is um, uh, greater than 3 and 10 71sts and less than uh, 3 and 1 seventh. So this is a really accurate uh, estimation for pi. Okay, um, and what is even better is that he noted that this calculation, this approximation, could be done to arbitrary accuracy. So he noted that the way that his method worked um, could have been carried out to make this bound even more accurate than this. Okay. Which is also impressive. Okay. And so the, the way he did this was inscribing a 96 gun in, in a circle. Okay. So inscribing a 96 gun in a circle. All right. Now I'm running out of time and I'm going to talk about Archimedes uh, more um, in the lecture that I upload on Monday. Uh, but um, this is uh, kind of the the big thing that Archimedes did. This is one of his most uh, uh, amazing um, uh, achievements so I didn't actually finish my uh, my rant on why Archimedes is the best mathematician ever so I'll have to revisit that so um, on the quadrature of the parabola is a work by Archimedes where um, what he is doing here so I won't spoil it. I'll show you the pictures first. 
Um, but what he is doing here is extremely impressive. And you'll quickly see why. Um, so let me... Yeah, here we go. So on the quadrature of the parabola. Okay. So he has a parabola. What is it that he's trying to do? Consider a parabola like this. What Archimedes wants to do is to compute the area of this region underneath the parabola. Okay, so he wants to compute this area. All right, so how does he go about doing this? So he begins by doing this construction. He's constructing some stuff, okay. Hmm. What's going on here? The next page really shows what's going on. Hmm. Where have you seen pictures like this before? So look at how he's splitting up these areas involved underneath this parabola. Right? And he even uses... How does he actually compute these areas? He does it using a geometric sum. Hmm. So that was that was it. What is it that he proved? He actually proved a formula for finding the area underneath this piece of the parabola. I'm going to go back here to this picture because this is kind of the 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 meat of the paper. What is it that he's doing here? This is extremely close to Riemann sums, right? And in fact, what he is basically doing here is integrating. Right? So he, he basically comes up with the notion of taking finding an integral here without calculus, right? He's, but he's basically doing calculus through his method of exhaustion in this way. Okay. So um this on the quadrature of the parabola this work of archimedes is the most uh this is the most advanced use of of math prior to um prior to calculus and prior to you know the 1600s basically so um so this is a particularly nice and impressive um achievement but it's certainly not the end. There's there's a ton of things that I can talk about. So I'll continue talking about those um, on uh, on the lecture I upload for Monday. So um, anyway, so I think that's all for today. I think I've run out of time. So um, I will uh, see you all next time. Um, I'll uh, I'll upload the lecture for Monday either on Sunday evening or sometime uh, during the day later on Monday. Um, so, um, so yeah, Monday's, Monday's lecture won't be recorded live, um, but, uh, that will be the last time that I have to do anything like that, hopefully. So anyway, um, I will see you all then.